Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. We're excited to share with you that we are kicking off 2022 with two new NARM trainings starting soon in January and February of 2022. If you're a licensed mental health practitioner, we invite you to join us for the level two NARM therapist training beginning on January 20th. This training will be offered in an online format and is designed to support mental health professionals who work with clients or populations dealing with complex trauma. Being trained in NARM, one of the first clinical models specifically designed to address adverse childhood experiences and complex post-traumatic stress disorder, supports therapists to learn how to address the long-term impacts of ACEs and CPTSD. If you are interested in this training, we encourage you to register now and reserve your spot. Please visit www.narmtraining.com slash level two online. For all other helping professionals, we invite you to join us for the level one NARM online basics training starting February 4th. This professional training is designed to support a basic foundation for addressing the effects of adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma. It is designed for substance abuse counselors, educators, coaches, clergy, doctors, nurses, and other allied healthcare workers. For more information and to register, please visit www.normtraining.com slash online basics. We look forward to you joining our growing international NARM community and are inspired to work with you to bring NARM to your clients and communities in order to transform trauma. And now for our interview. Today's guest is Dr. Nadine Macaluso. Dr. Nay is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Glen Cove, New York. She has a PhD in counseling and somatic psychotherapy, specifically honoring the mind-body connection. Her work is informed by the NAR model, and she carries a strong emotional and relational intelligence as she supports individuals struggling to map their own journey and overcome self-doubt. Her new book, Trauma Bond Free, A Therapist's Guide for Healing from Traumatic Love, grew out of her own personal life experience as she healed from the terror and trauma of her first marriage to the wolf on Wall Street. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Nadine Macaluso. All right. I'm here with Dr. Nadine Macaluso. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Hello. I'm just really looking forward to this conversation and because I've I've really enjoyed the content that you're putting out into the world on social media and and with your new book. And I thank first you. wanted to just take this time to say thank you for sharing space here with the Transforming Trauma community. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. So as you might already know, we often start our conversation here in a similar way that we would start a NARM session. And so I'll just start by asking, what is it that you would like for listeners to get out of our time together today? Yeah, I thought about that question. And what I would like for listeners to get out of our conversation is to offer hope to everybody. I think this has been a very hard year and a half or two years for all of us, no matter who we are. We've experienced collective trauma clearly, and that there are ways to get through overwhelming experiences because that's what trauma is, a wound that overwhelms us. Mm. And so I'm hopeful that uh, I will offer some tips and some education and, you know, just leave everyone feeling a tad more vitality inside. Great. Mm. That could lead into a few different paths that I have right now of of curiosity because there's so much there. I mean, it's already so rich what you're sharing with us. So I wonder if we could start first maybe by having you share with us a little bit about the work that you're doing in the field of complex trauma, and then maybe we can circle back and talk more about your personal connection and what drew you to the work. Sure. So complex trauma, or right, some people call it complex PTSD or attachment trauma, is everywhere. I haven't met a person that's had a perfect childhood or hasn't had some overwhelming experiences as they were developing as a child or even overwhelming experiences in their current adult relationships. And so it informs my work daily because whether you have a mood disorder, you're anxious and depressed, you have relationship issues, you have a a deep sense of shame that lives within you. Those are all the things that people come to therapy about. 
Yeah. And I think probably, you know, most of our listeners are, are likely familiar with the term of complex trauma, but I'm curious how you would define complex trauma. Yeah. So before I would even define complex trauma, I would want to define what attachment is Hmm. because attachment is life itself. When we are born, we need to be attached to another being who can take care of us, who can love us, who can hear us, who can see us, who can respond to us, who's accessible to us. And so we can't live if we don't have a parent or a caregiver or someone to take care of us. And so we need to be attached to them, that quality of connection that we have. And then also we need to be able to separate from them and to know that they're going to be there when we come back. And so that's the healthy part of it. Mm -hmm. And complex PTSD is when those things go wrong. And so it's any experience that occurs between the parent and child in their early development when the child feels wounded from their exchange with their caregiver or parent. The child might feel scared, fearful, hurt, bad. And this happens chronically throughout their development. And that can happen through many different ways. Too many ways, unfortunately. I mean, the most obvious ones are physical abuse, sexual abuse, but it's also very nuanced too. You know, I mean, there's verbal abuse, there's emotional neglect, emotional rejection the child feels because the parent doesn't allow them to express their emotions. And the child usually feels rejected or abandoned and overwhelmed. And that's traumatic to a child. Right. Right. I I so appreciate that you're naming. It doesn't have to be some big shocking, you know, experience or abuse that is so profound. Yeah. Yeah. Or a parent, it can, it can be very nuanced. I really appreciate that you're naming that because I I think a lot of folks, you know, think, oh, I had a pretty good childhood. I don't. Oh, I was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, (laughs) we don't realize just how much there is. So I so appreciate Mm -hmm. that you're naming that, that there's a lot of nuance there and it can seem kind of subtle, but when you get really underneath that, there's more. So there's a lot there. Yeah. And so, you know, I can give a prime example too. I think examples are good. I really thought I had a perfect childhood, you know, till I got into adult relationships. (laughs) They reflected to me that I didn't. And my mother would always brag that I walked and talked at nine months. Oh, she was so proud of that. And then I, as I did my research through NARM, it was like children that walk and talk at nine months are usually neglected. Oh. (laughs) So Mm. I wasn't abused, but my parents were 19 and 20 year old hippies that were clueless. Yeah. Right. And so there are so many ways witnessing domestic violence. I mean, a family that doesn't have healthy boundaries, a child that feels used, or I had some role reversal where I was more parentified. Actually, too, if we think about the separation process, when a child wants to individuate and differentiate themselves, yeah. right? My mother rejected me when I wanted to do that because she had her own unresolved wounds. So complex PTSD is a violation of connection and attachment that happens early on when the child's brain and nervous system really cannot manage that because Once the child feels separated from their primary caregiver, it feels threatening. Mm. Yeah. And I think something else that you're naming there too, that that feels really important for me and maybe, you know, some of those listening, that the parents, they don't have to be terrible parents or, or, you know, overly abusive. They could be actually really loving, but when the child is trying to differentiate and individuate and step out, that that, if the parent has their own unresolved issues, that that will come up and that that could be another way. Yes that the child yes. can experience that. Yeah, what you're sharing here is so rich, so rich. Yeah, well, and Larry really taught me about the complex PTSD. Yes, it involves, you know, ruptures and attachment, but also ruptures and separation. Mm-hmm. And I, thanks, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my mind's a little blown right now. Hold on just oh, a second. that's okay, that's <laughs> okay. Up. Will you say that again, that it could be ruptures in separation? Is that how you said it? Yeah, in separation, because... For me, the way I define love or attachment or bonding, it's the quality of connection that you feel with somebody. And it's also the space that they give you or that they contain for you to be your unique self, to be different, your individual separate self. 
And I think that's a very important piece of it too. At least it was for me in my development and what I've learned through Norm and what I see in my patients. Wow. This is very dense and I feel like you've done a really good job of sharing it in, in a quick way there. So now I'm curious if you could share more about how you're bringing this work into, you know, work with your patients and your clients and Sure. So I was getting my doctorate in somatic psychotherapy and one of my peers said, you know, I'm taking this training called the neuroaffective relational model. I love Norm. The name is a little <laughs> tough. So that's why I call myself a Normie. And I was very grateful for that because as much as they were teaching us in school, they weren't teaching us how to work with the body. I had learned how to work with the mind through my master's, but I really wanted to understand how to utilize the body in the clinical encounter. And so that's how I found Norm. And I mean, I'm forever grateful to Dr. Heller. I know I'm calling him Larry, but let's just be professional mm -hmm. here and say, because I just learned so much there. And I don't care if people come with anxiety, depression, bipolar, personality disorders, relationship issues. At the end of it is complex PTSD and shame. And I love how NARM depathologizes whatever somatic or mental health issues we are having. And so how I bring it into the room is I, uh, a long time ago, one of the first people in our, when Brad and I were studying together, they came up with a NARM quiz. And I have every single one of my patients take that. And I know Dr. Heller says, don't put people in categories. But people love it because we need connection right? We need to get our needs met. We need to trust. We need to be able to express ourselves and we need to be flexible, open, and adaptive. And NARM has broken down categories based on bioenergetics, right? And whatever developmental milestone was interrupted through attachment trauma shows up in the test. And I'm an attun attunement autonomy style, like a lot of therapists. And so I can say to my patients, okay, this is what you missed. Your needs were denied. You weren't allowed to express yourself. You weren't allowed to trust. That's your core issue, right? And I'm saying it in a simple way, but Norm allowed me and my patients and I to look at their identity, both mind and body, in a non-pathological way. Mm. Yeah. What you just said that really just landed for me is as you're sharing with them and as they're sharing their experience that you're able to say, this is not your pathology. These are things that you missed. Like this is what you didn't get as a child instead of making it about you're wrong or, you know, what sometimes can happen in therapy that you're really able to share with them that frame of, you know, these are the survival styles. This is some of the ways that I'm seeing that you survived. That's so vital. Yeah. Yeah. And those adaptive survival styles, mm -hmm. they allowed you to adapt and to stay connected to your parents or your caregivers. Right. And so you probably have overused them. Mine personally were, I don't have needs. Everybody has needs. I don't have needs. And I would people please, because caretaking is the number one way to uh, stay loved. Caretaking others. Right. Right. Now I just turn my pathology into my profession. <laughs> <laughs> so I explained that they were adapted, whatever, whatever they use, and they probably got out of balance and they use them too much. And now let's find another way. What I love about Norm is that I'll never forget in my first training, I think I said to Larry, he's like, who has something to say? And I said, I realized I know nothing. And he said, wait, say more about that. And I said, well, you've told us to be very curious. And all I am is curious to connect people back to themselves and everything that I assume that they're feeling, they're never feeling. Mm. And Norm is really about connecting people back to their authentic selves, right? And so it's so reflective. You are always reflective and questioning and curious with the tapestry of theory behind me. That's been a huge gift. And I, I know that my patients, and I do call them patients, they're not clients, I'm not a lawyer, appreciate that. They appreciate that, that I'm curious and I want to get to know them. And then through that, they get to know themselves. Through your curiosity, it's almost like as you're modeling that curiosity, they can then, it's okay for them to be curious and, and for them to get to know themselves. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And not judge themselves because... 
what we know is that when the child feels bad because they're missed, they're not feeling felt or heard or seen or they're chastised or they're punished or they're abused or they feel rejected, the child, when they feel bad, thinks that they are bad because they cannot dare blame the parent. They have to blame themselves, and that's the beginning of shame and self-blame. So curiosity and acceptance, I think, takes that away. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing it in that way, because it's, again, as you said, even a lot of us come to this field because of our own you know, ways of wanting to caretake and whatnot, and, and that's what we did. And I, I like that you highlighted the word adaptive. These are adaptive survival styles. Right. And it runs on a spectrum. And for some people, they had to adapt by, you know, hating themselves so severely and just shutting down and being frozen. Yeah. Yeah. So I I wondered if it would be okay if you shared with us a little bit about how you came to this work in a personal way. Whatever you'd like to share, we're here for. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not that private at this point. <laughs> I'm 53. I let it all hang out. Because you know what? I don't care, care yeah. what people think about yeah. me finally. And that's yeah. a, that's yeah, a free beautiful. feeling. Yeah. yeah, so I grew up in a very, my mother was actually, had a, a lot of her own relational trauma. She was in a orphanage for the first two years of her life. And then her parents went back and got her. And so she was in the 1970s when humanistic psychology was very popular with Abraham Maslow and Carl Jung and Carl Rogers, right? There was that movement. And so she was reading all about it. And so every single night around the dinner table, she would say, is it nature or nurture that shapes us? And I was like, mom, I'm 10. I really don't care. But she planted those seeds of curiosity into me. I didn't know why she was asking me that. And then... I grew up in Brooklyn with a single mother, and my life was pretty charmed, I thought, or so she wanted me to believe, I guess, and she did a good job at that. And then once I went out into the world in New York City, things changed. I was modeling because I had to support myself because my parents at 17 were like, bye-bye, you know, you can support yourself now, right? Because they had their own woundsing, and I was, and then I met my ex-husband, the Wolf of Wall Street. He wasn't that then. He was my husband. I was 23 and he was 28. We fell in love and we, and I was in a trauma bond. I didn't know that then, but I knew something was very wrong because he was very abusive and controlling. And then he became addicted to drugs. And at 23, I was no match for him. But at that age, I put myself into therapy. Mm. Had two children, left him. And my kids are great. My daughter's a therapist. Hi, Chandler and Carter. He's a rapper. He's a poet. They're doing fantastic. And uh, then I, at 39, I I decided to go back to school and become a therapist because it saved my life, therapy. Got my master's, went for my doctorate, and then I stumbled into Norm, and the rest, as they say, is her story. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So this this work really was a personal, I mean, it sounds like you going into therapy at 23. I mean, that's amazing. The self-awareness there that you got yourself in is amazing. But then the, as you did your work, you knew this was there was a passion inside of you for that. Yeah. I don't think I quite knew the extent of it, honestly. I just said, there's no ageism. I like education. I'm a forever student. And I want to help people. I want to be of service. You know, I'm also a Jungian and there's a term called generativity and I want to leave something in the world. Yeah. Beautiful. So in this work, as you came to NARM, I'm curious if complex trauma was, can you talk about how that helped you to even just have the awareness of that's what it was to kind of have a name for it? And yeah, yeah, I'm curious how that's helped you. That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. So I think when I became a therapist, I don't know that I really understood attachment. I certainly knew about trauma from my ex-husband, but I didn't really understand about attachments. And I was very confused because I wasn't abused as a child that how I ended up in such an abusive relationship, it wasn't necessarily a reenactment in that way. And so I guess as I learned about my own neglect or the experiences that I had as a child and adolescent, Everything just became like a puzzle and started to fit together. And NAR made me understand about attachment and developmental trauma. And then 
through my own life experiences, a non is a phenomenological theory, which means that it's all based in experience, right? Mm -hmm. Fancy word for meaning that we learn from experience. Mm -hmm. And so then I just started, I'm a crazy researcher. And I just started to research about attachment and relationships and developmental trauma. And then I discovered the term trauma bond. And I was like, wow, I was in a trauma bond. And then I started to understand what a trauma bond is. And we know that the limbic brain, the emotional part of the brain likes categories. And then it just like, I can't even explain what happened, honestly. I don't think there are words. Then it just kept ballooning. And when I was in therapy at 23, do you think my therapist looked at me and said, you're in a trauma bond, I think you should leave? No, but I do that with my patients, not in a way, you know, and, and Larry really taught me a lot about this is that you want to stay curious. And then there's that fine line of also educating your patients. I don't need to hold all of this information. I don't need to be the expert. And Larry always taught us that, like, no, you are collaborating with your patient. You are equals. Yeah. And I, I enjoy sharing what I wish my therapist would have shared with me. Hmm. The world was a different place 25 years ago for therapists. Yeah. We didn't have these words. Right. I, in fact, when you said I discovered the term trauma bonding and I'm like, when did that become a thing? I mean, obviously it's been a thing, but like, when were there words for that? When did we in this field understand that? Because I don't think it was that long ago. I don't think it was that long ago. I mean, complex PTSD is just recognized by the World Health Organization. Right. I think Brad said recently, yeah, right? Yeah, it's not even in the DSM, right? So like- Right. Oh my God, new. I can burn the DSM. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, sorry, but I don't use that. Right, right. It's not helpful. Yeah. It works for insurance companies, I guess. Right. But, so these terms are now really in the zeitgeist, I guess. Yeah. Can we talk about your book a little bit? I, I sure, just, of course. I, I was telling you before we pressed record, I finished reading it last night and was kind of scanning over it again this morning. And there are so many things I love about what you share in there. I mean, part of it is it's so personal, like you're sharing yourself. It feels like just sitting down and like yeah. you're hearing from a friend. So there's that like personal element, but then you also take a lot of like academic concepts and you put them into everyday language that anyone who picks up that book could understand. And I just think that's so valuable how you're bringing this work of NARM, you know, and all these terms that like could be really confusing, but you, you break it down in such a way that is it's conversational and engaging. And I, so I love the book. I just have to say that I really oh, appreciated thanks. the way that and your style of writing it was just such an enjoyable read but i'm curious what you know share what you want to share but i'm i'm so curious what led you to write the book and all that stuff yeah so what led me to write the book that's a good one so you know i lived with my ex-husband i was married to him for 8 years and i have two beautiful children and i left him and it was a very painful time in my life again because i didn't i had never heard anybody yell and then this person's all of a sudden yelling at me and I'm like, what's happening? And it was very scary and a very traumatic experience. And I'd never experienced trauma at that level. I had a lot of fear. Fear is a really important piece of complex PTSD. We feel threatened. We don't feel safe. And I really didn't feel safe. And mm -hmm. so it was a very, very scary time in my life. And I picked my children up. We moved to California. I met my second husband, who I'm still married to, and I was doing something very different. But my ex-husband decided to write a book about our traumatic experience. So even though I had done a lot of work on it, mm -hmm. right, I always say well, relationships are a reflection. I guess I'm not done with this work. So I did not like the book. I did not agree with the book. And yet it happens. And then there becomes a major motion picture that's made over $450 million all over the world. And it's Martin Scorsese's number one movie about my life that was a tragedy. Wow. So life keeps forcing me into deep reflection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and understanding and learning. And so I love to write. I'm a masochist. If you love to write, you're a masochist. Just know that about yourself, okay? Yeah. Because it's a very arduous process. Yeah. It's also very cathartic. Mm -hmm. And so I was writing a lot about shame and norm. And I kept writing, writing, writing. And then I think some agent had reached out to me and I was going to be on TV. And all of a sudden, I had written for about seven years about various things. Trauma, trauma bonds, therapy, emotions, emotional regulation, 
the body, somatic psychotherapy. And all of a sudden I looked at my assistant and I said, we got to get a book together in two weeks on trauma bonds. She's like, what? She's like, you're crazy. I'm like, well, we know I'm crazy. I mean, really, you know I'm crazy. <laughs> and we did it and we got it ready for the show. Cause I was like, I can't go to the doctors and not have something to sell, but I'm not a seller. Right. Mm. And so that's what forced me to put it together. And we put that together with my also website designer, Matt McRae. He did all the graphics, which is very beautiful because I'm a very aesthetic person. It is beautiful. Yeah. And we did it. And now that that actually, it's not great, but I appreciate you saying it's good because it's, it's not great, but that's okay. That's my perfectionism. I own that. That's a shame-based way to get over, you know, not being enough. Actually, now I have a publisher. And so I have to go back and rewrite it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the trauma bonds are a very important thing to discuss. Mm -hmm. We've seen with Gabby Petito. We've seen with uh, Singer or Kelly, who just got, I don't know, so many counts of abuse, is that Mm -hmm. trauma is also an abuse of power. And Mm -hmm. so now a lot of my work is working with people that have been abused in relationships, interpersonal relationships. Yeah. educating them about themselves, educating them about what this abuse looks like and helping them grow and heal. That's beautiful work. As I was reading the book, I just kept thinking, anyone who is in a relationship who who doesn't have the language for what a trauma bond is, or, you know, like they could pick up that book and see themselves in it. The way that you've written it is so, it's so helpful in that way that it's not so specific that it's like, you have to fit in this box. It's like, if you're experiencing these things, you might want to take a look at this. Yeah. And so I just can see how helpful that book can be. And, and as you're rewriting it now, can we say the, the name of it now, or is the title going to change or? I mean, I like to call it trauma bond free. Oh, okay. So I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, what the title will be. <laughs> yeah, but, it, you know, it's like us. We're always evolving. We're always growing. We're always yeah. changing. I mean, neuroplasticity and our nervous system being able to change allows us to do that. Right. Beautiful. Well, we'll at the end, we'll we'll send people to your website and they'll be able to see whatever, yeah, that, whatever yes. version is. Of course, is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I love that framing of we're all evolving and we're all changing. And so that's yeah. how you've put that out into the world can shift and change too in, in your book. So that's really beautiful. Yeah, I just, I really appreciate that your work grows out of such a personal, like a tender space and and the fruits, you know, of that, that even just on your social media, I'm, I was looking at your Twitter and what you have out on Facebook. It's just evidence that what you're offering in the world is such heart centered work. And it I is. wondered if you could speak to that a little and maybe share just about how you were affected personally in therapy. I mean, you did say a little bit, so maybe that's... So I, I, like I said, I've been in therapy my whole life. I think this is like, I actually just took a break recently because I'm 53 and I've been in therapy since I'm 23. <laughs> I think that what therapy offered me, and Carl Rogers said this, the more you accept yourself, the more you can change, ironically. And I think that therapy offers truly a place of non-judgment. And if we think about complex PTSD... We want to please our parents. We want our parents to love us. I mean, they do have their biases put upon us, right? That we want to give to them to stay attached and to stay safe. And so therapy for me was a place to throw out whatever they wanted or needed. And being raised by a single mother, if I didn't have her, I was dead. Because that, my gambling addicted father bailed already, right? I mean, even though he came in and out of my life, but... So therapy for me has been a place to learn about myself without judgment and to learn about my shame. I had a lot more shame than I ever realized. Yeah. And then when Norm came along, one of the things that I love about Norm is it really embraces the complex PTSD. I mean, embrace is a weird word, but it really illuminates Mm -hmm. that complex PTSD causes us to swing between pride and shame. And I'm using that motion and purpose because I am a somatic psychotherapist, right? So there's something about gesture that's really important and that actually who we are is in the middle. Like all my therapy up till Norm never really illuminated that, but Norm really illuminated that for me that I would swing between, you know, I have no needs. I have no needs. My my needs are shame-based, but then being so prideful and being like, oh, I have no needs, but I can take care of you. I can compensate for my needs not meeting it. Uh, but then it's like, no, I do have needs. 
Oh. And I have to be vulnerable and get my needs met and ask for them, mm-hmm. you know, because I miss that developmental milestone. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really important piece of it. And to feel safe enough to do that. Yeah. Right. To feel like I'm not going to lose the attachment to my partner or to my friends if I ask to get my needs met, if I'm vulnerable enough to say, I have needs, this is what they are. Can you please meet them? Mm. And therapy taught me to connect enough to myself to even know what I needed. Right. When you don't think you have needs, how do you even know what you need? Exactly. When we're so disconnected from that, we can become so disconnected from even a desire. I mean, forget needs, like even just our desires, right? Even knowing what we might want for ourselves. It's even just like that question that we asked in the beginning, what is it that you would want for yourself or that you would want the listeners? If we're not connected to ourselves, we won't even know what that is. And that, which is information, right? It's information. Yeah. And I, I think you bring about an important word. Another thing that Norm taught me is that developmental trauma really disconnects us from ourselves and from others in an authentic way. And the work is to find the road back to that. Oh, yeah. And it's scary when we have relied on denying that for survival. Or to not many people, right? How many people judge their emotions? <laughs> As I raise my hand, like I've done that. Yeah. I'm like, I shouldn't be feeling that that's stupid. I'm like, well, what if we just sat with that emotion? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. What if we didn't judge that emotion? Mm-hmm. What would happen? Where would that emotion lead you? Oh, that's so touching to just create that space and get curious again, like you said. Mm-hmm. I wondered if you would share with us any stories, if you have any stories of struggle or, or even inspiration in working with clients who have dealt with complex trauma. Oh, yeah. I bet you do. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, since everybody has it, right? I think a story that I'd like to share is a very universal story, one of a person who really could not express themselves, really believed that if they expressed themselves, they would not be safe, they would not be loved. And working week after week with that person, A, connecting themselves to what they felt and what they needed and what they desired, as you spoke of. And then I was saying, okay, well, you've told me that because you've connected to that, can you now express that to a person of authority, to a person that you think is above you? And then when they can do that, some might call it confrontation or, you know, trauma causes us to want to avoid. So some might say, okay, I didn't avoid, I approached what I wanted, I expressed what I wanted. And then they come back like, yes, And I always say change isn't about this big change. It's those moments in our daily lives over and over again that are chronic, just like the issues that didn't support our connection to ourselves that are chronic, that elicit change. Right. That's so important for us to remember. I mean, even just as you said that, I'm taking that in. It's such a good reminder because, yeah, just like in childhood, the things that were chronic Now that we're adults and we have better um, availability of our agency that we can create a positive, more, you know, chronic in a positive way, those small decisions like you named. Right. Because people think like they have to like like, clown emotional Mount Mount Kilimanjaro. (laughs) No, (laughs) no, you don't. You have to set boundaries and, and have self definition and say no or say yes, based upon your authenticity. Mm-hmm. It could be little, like, what do you want to have? What type of coffee you want to have? What type of food do you want to eat? How do you want to exercise? How do you want to approach your partner? And you keep doing that little and often, little and often, little and often. It becomes you're connected more to your authenticity and you're expressing yeah. your authentic self. Yeah. Well, that makes me remember just how you said one of the things that share- therapy did for you was to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. And so just like you said, those moment by moment, it's all those small decisions as we get to reconnect with ourselves. Okay, what is it that I really want in this moment? How do I want to take my coffee? Even those small moments can help us get to know ourselves better. And that's a really beautiful way of describing it. Thank you. Yeah. And as you touched your chest, I'm reminded of how our self really lives in our nervous system and in our body. You know, we feel things from, let's just say, I, I, I mean, maybe our face from here down, right? And yeah. into our pelvic floor. And that's where that authentic self lives. 
And that's why the body work is so important because what Norm taught me is when a patient would say something that they're feeling, I would say, where do you experience that in your body? What sensations, like to anchor it for them. Yeah. We don't feel emotions in our elbow. <laughs> and I don't. Right, right, I mean, right. I mean, unless I get like, you know, I hit my elbow, but... I'm not like, oh, my elbow feels sad. I mean, maybe it does. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. It's like we feel it in our body and our body doesn't lie. And mm. our, our brain often and our adaptive survival skills live a lot in the thoughts and in the brain, not in the nervous system, the vagus nerve. Yeah, I love what you said there. The body doesn't lie. We can return when we return to ourselves that there's truth there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, return to our embodiment. That's very important. What for people who've had so much developmental trauma or complex PTSD, they had to disconnect from what they were feeling. It was overwhelming to them in their body. So to hold that space for them to connect to themselves through the body really is so much more authentic than what they think or what they think they should say or any defense adaptive survival skill. Yeah. They had to disconnect from their bodies. It wasn't safe. That is so important to name. I'm so glad that you brought that up because again, as we understand that the reason that we adapted and that we survived in the ways that we did is because it wasn't safe to stay in our body in so many ways. And so that can kind of help release the shame, even just as you're saying it, it's like, again, it's a good reminder. I've been in this work for years now and I'm still like peeling the onion oh. of, of those reminders of like, oh, that's right. That's why I have done that. That's why I sometimes do that. And now that I have the awareness, I'm going to choose to go another way, but to not shame ourselves, like you said earlier. Yeah, shaming. And that was a term that Larry definitely taught me. Shaming myself or mm -hmm. shaming yourself. That is a huge one. And what he said about it, and I use this all the time, is that we're doing it to ourselves. And if we're doing it to ourselves, that's where the agency comes in. We can stop. Yeah. You're the one doing it to yourself. Stop shaming yourself for not being perfect. It's unattainable. It's unrealistic. It's a way to cover up the shame. So since you're the one doing it, you're the one that can stop it. And I think the agency piece is so important. We do to us what was done to us through our complex PTSD. And we take our power back, or as I call that last chapter of healing, Right. Or which is only the ability to influence ourselves. Mm. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do that to survive. You're an adult now, as long as you have reasonable faculties available to you. Right. Yeah. That was one of the things that I really appreciated about the book is the balance that you struck of like the compassion for the ways that we've had to survive and adapt. And then also the piece of and we're adults and we can choose something else and to move forward. I just think that's so important. Again, first to have that compassion so that we're not shaming ourselves as much anymore, hopefully, and that we can move into that, pushing our edges and taking advantage of our agency, right? And in, in new ways yeah. and expansion. And I understand if agency, which is, you know, the ability to be an, an agent of action for yourself, really, right? If that was shamed, I can understand why that would be scary and you would avoid that. And now you're an adult and take a risk. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. I've heard you, you know, speak in other areas. I've, I've um, again, consumed some of the content that you've put out there. And I've heard you talk about just as your patients have come to you, and, and especially if they know a little bit of your story, maybe you can speak to this, but that you've modeled that in your life, that patients can see your life and say, wow, you started here and this is where you're at. This is what you're doing with your life. I just found that so beautiful. Right. Because, you know, if we go back to the old model of being a therapist, you know, the therapist was a blank screen or, you know, you didn't really know about your therapist. So ironically, as I was, I think, going into my doctorate program and still finishing my hours for my master's program, this movie came out about my life. And I was like, OK, <laughs> this is really strange that I am going to be one of those therapists that people know about. Now, I made them change my name for the movie, but that didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so ironically, I want to offer this to people, what I worried about. I'm like, oh, my God, people are going to see me in this movie. They're going to think, like, what the f***? Excuse my French. I'm like, what's this girl? Yeah. It didn't turn out that way. 
what I worried about it didn't matter. They were like, wait, you, and then I did surrender because I've done enough work. Mm. I said, Nadine, surrender. This is bigger than you, surrender. And so what they all said to me, if you went through that, that tells me that you've done some work on yourself to get to the other side. And so I actually think you can help me get to the other side. And I was like, oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> I was so yeah. Yeah. And it is true. But therapists don't go to therapy and say, okay, well, let me tell you why I am, you know, right. a good candidate for you. Yeah. This is what I've gone through. <laughs> You know, so mm-hmm. that was a weird thing, but I guess that's my uh, destiny fate. I always get those two confused. I admit that this mm-hmm. is where I'm at. Yeah. Well, I really appreciated that, you know, as continuing to do my own work and, and moving into the field, how valuable that perspective is. Yes. The sort of mess of my life. <laughs> I can use it. I can use it and, and move forward. And I was so inspired by that. So I'm glad that you shared that. Yeah, it's yeah. important, you know, and I... Because the therapists are people. Yeah, we're human. My kids are in therapy. Mm -hmm. My daughter's a therapist, but both of my kids call me this week upset. You know, the growth never ends. I get upset. Yeah. But now what's happened through NARM and my own work is that I have more resilience. NARM has allowed me to build inner resources of compassion, Mm -hmm. self-validation, self-activation, self-knowledge, self-awareness to manage those issues that life inevitably throws at us. It's not that life stops throwing us issues. Right. It's that we develop the inner resources and we trust that others will be there because another thing of complex PTSD, of course, is that we don't trust others. So we need inner and outer resources to build resilience and have agency to deal with whatever life throws at us. And that's the message of hope. Yeah. Life doesn't get that much easier. You just get better at it. <laughs> you get better at it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I can I do it. this. I can do this. Yeah. Imperfectly, but I can do this. Yeah, I so appreciate that. Well, being a mother, I'm sure you do. <laughs> yes. Yes. Being the imperfect parent that I am, it's nice to give myself some do-overs and know that I don't have to be perfect at it. And, and the idea that, you know, as parents... Some of the mistakes I make, I guess, it's providing my children to know themselves better as well. I mean, I, my parents weren't perfect and I learned from that and, and hopefully my kids are able to navigate that as well. Yeah. And that's evolution. I always say to my patients, you know, my mom did the best she could. I'm doing the best I could. My daughter's going to do the best she can. Mm -hmm. I know. Or my son, you know, and that's how we all grow and evolve as a species. Right. I mean, I haven't met anybody who does it perfect. You don't have to do it perfect and you can still have post-traumatic growth. Yes. And again, this goes along with your message of hope that you mentioned at the beginning is that theme of post-traumatic growth, how important that is to keep that in mind. Yeah. And and I felt hopeless. I felt helpless, which are different words for anxiety and depression. I think they're more approachable words. And it's been hard. And... Once you construct the inner resources and outer resources, you don't have to do it alone. You can move forward. Oh, this has been so lovely to talk with you. I I really appreciate you. you And and I'll call you Dr. Nay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I, I just so appreciate you bringing the work that you're doing into the world and sharing it here with us and transforming trauma. I I wondered as we start to wrap up, if there's anything else that's sort of feeling left unsaid or anything else that you'd like to add. Yeah. So I just want to add about the three things that get affected by complex PTSD, which is a lot of times they call it a negative self-concept or a negative self-image. I hate those words. They're so psychological, but we feel shame. We don't feel good about ourselves. Or we have emotional dysregulation, which means we can't handle the highs and lows of our emotions, right? And we have struggle in our interpersonal relationships. And I think that a key piece of that is emotions and being able to, in our body, connect with and feel our emotions in a safe way with a therapist that feels safe. And if you can, as Dr. Heller says, contain your emotions, which doesn't mean act them out at rage and blaming, criticizing others, or act them in with rage and blame and hatred towards yourself, but be with them and let them inform you, let them be an internal compass as how to move forward. That's very helpful. 
because a lot of parents have a hard time with their children's emotions. They don't want them to feel negative emotions and they only concentrate on the positive emotions. But as we know, we were born with eight primary emotions and we are emotional beings. And I love that about Norm is that it really taught me. I actually was lucky. I had a mother. That's what she was very good at, me being with my emotions. Mm -hmm. But Norm really emphasizes that how to be with them, hold them, ride them like a wave, and know that they end, mm -hmm. let them be your compass, unless they're shame and self-blame, mm -hmm. which we don't want you to go there or guilt, but the other ones. Yeah. And I think that's really important because we're emotional beings that need connection. So don't fear your emotions, embrace yeah. them, get curious about them, yeah. be with them. And they're hard to hold in the body. Yeah. And that body work lets you be with them. Feel the sensation of it. Name it to tame it. Name what you're feeling. Don't judge it. And then say, oh, okay, I can do that. And then you move on. I think that's an important piece of Norm. Thank you so much for that. Oh, well, this has just been a treat. And you have, oh, you have a, you. a lovely way of just being... I mean, as a therapist, you obviously you have that, but but even just in conversation, you have a lovely way of of being with, and I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thank you, Emily. Yeah, you know, this is my life's work, you know, and it's a gift, and I'm very grateful. I can't believe I get paid <laughs> to do this. I'm like sometimes I pinch myself. <laughs> I'm like, what's happening? What's that. happening to your life? And I want to thank Norm, and I want to thank Dr. Heller for giving me the gift of this theory that has changed my life and has helped me change a lot of people's lives, even in, again, in ways that are meaningful that, again, you don't have to be, I don't know, they just, you don't have to write a song. You don't have to like, you know, have this big overture of what change means. Just, he taught me that the opposite of mm. depression is vitality, not happiness. So like I offer to all of your listeners, I hope that you feel more alive. You give your permission, yourself permission to feel alive. And if you contract and feel smaller, that's okay too, knowing that you will feel more alive. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that was a beautiful way to end. So I did want to give um, listeners a little bit of information about how they can track you down, how they can you know, reach you on the various channels. So I wondered if you could share with us where listeners can find you on Instagram at Dr. Nay, N-A-E. Mm -hmm. And you can also go to my website, nadinemacaluso.com, mm -hmm. where I have tons of resources, tons of assessments. Great. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. If you're a licensed mental health practitioner, we invite you to join us for the level two NARM therapist training beginning on January 20th. In this training, you will learn a comprehensive developmental framework and clinical approach. For more information and to register, please visit www.narmtraining.com slash level two online. For all other helping professionals, we invite you to join us for the level one NARM online basics training starting February 4th. In this online training, participants will learn more about the changing field of trauma, the framework of the NARM approach, and how NARM, one of the first models specifically designed to address CPTSD, can support professionals in the growing trauma-informed field. If you are looking for more advanced training in understanding the impacts of attachment, relational, developmental, cultural, and intergenerational trauma, join us for this level one NARM training to become a NARM informed professional. Please visit www.narmtraining.com slash online basics. Thanks to Andrea Clunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma. Mm -hmm.